Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the equine grazing system, the key to farm sustainability and horse welfare thematic session. So with the first presentation today, we have uh, Dr. Jennifer Weinert Nelson. She's a USDA um, postdoc at the University of Kentucky, and she's going to present the first presentation uh, entitled The Hindgut Microbiome of Grazing Horses. Well, thank you all for taking the time to be here with us this afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Jennifer Weiner Nelson. I am a USDA funded uh, postdoc with the USDA ARS Forage Animal Production Research Unit, which is co-located with the University of Kentucky. And I just want to take a second to thank uh, FAFRU for the opportunity to be here uh, to give this talk today. However, uh, we know that we're in the horse thematic session, uh, so we're going to take it back a little bit to my PhD work uh, and some of the work that we did with the microbiome of the grazing horse in my PhD. And so we all know that horses are hindgut fermenters, okay? So what does this mean? We know that in the foregut, which extends from the esophagus through the small intestine, um, this is where we see digestion, particularly starting in the stomach and really in the small intestine, the enzymatic breakdown and absorption of nutrients like sugars, starches, proteins. But like all mammals, horses do not possess enzymes that can break down the bonds in fiber. And so horses are what are called hindgut fermenters. They're hindgut which is basically their cecum, large colon, small colon, harbors a large population of microbes that are capable of breaking down the fiber in their diets. And this is really important, okay? So this is what happens. <laughs> It's fun. <laughs> so we've got fiber from forage, and we typically think of this, but it's important to note that we always think of horses are hindgut fermenters, and it's fiber in the hindgut that gets digested. Uh, but there are also other things. There are sugars, starches, and proteins that escape digestion by uh, enzymatic digestion in the small intestine that end up in the hindgut that also get broken down there as well. Um, and the result of this is the production of some byproducts that can then be absorbed and utilized by the animal. And importantly are the short chain fatty acids. Sometimes you might hear this referred to as volatile fatty acids. And the reason that these are so important is because these actually provide something like 50 to 70 percent of the horse's energy requirements or meat are used to meet about 50 to 75 percent of the horse's energy requirements. So it's really an important source of nutrients for horses. And this is particularly important when we think about grazing horses, right? Because forages are high in fiber. So when we think about that hindgut microbiome of the grazing horse and how important that is for that animal's health and nutrition, um, there are, if we think about microbiome research, uh, there's comparatively limited research in the hindgut microbiome of grazing horses. It's not well studied uh, in terms in comparison to other aspects of the microbiome in horses, and definitely, as we'll see later, uh, in comparison to other species or you know, even when we talk about humans and laboratory animals. But in the grazing horse, we kind of break this down. There's three primary areas of study that you see in the literature. So the first one is interdiet comparison. So this might be things like pasture versus hay, horses adapted to pasture versus horses being fed mixed diets that might include forage and a concentrate, or maybe even differences in that high gut microbiome between horses that are consuming different pasture forages. There is a small set of research that is focused on seasonal changes in the high gut microbiome of the grazing horse and some more recent publications that have started to explore this relationship between metabolism of the horse and hindgut microbiome. But really, this is where the bulk of the research is going to lie. And if we think about this, actually, most of the research isn't actually com these comparisons that I've listed up here. It's this, right? Most of your literature is going to be forage versus concentrate. And when you think about that, what is kind of the consensus in the literature is that 
forage versus concentrate uh, and feeding those two things does have an impact on species composition in terms of the, the bacteria that are there as well as function and has some implications in terms of the horse. And the consensus is kind of from the literature. The consensus is that a higher forage diet, uh, horses consuming that higher forage diet are going to have greater alpha diversity and temporal stability in their hindgut microbiome. They're going to have a greater prevalence of cellulitic bacteria, so those bacteria that degrade the fiber in the forage. They're going to have a lower prevalence of amylolytic and lactate utilizing bacteria, so those are the bacteria that degrade starch, sugar, um, and use that lactate that's produced from the degradation of starch and sugar. They're going to have greater prevalence of short chain fatty acids like acetate and butyrate. And they're going to have a lower, uh, lower concentration of short chain fatty acids like propionate and lactate. But that's, that's not exactly grazing horse, right? I and mean, some of those studies were pastured horses versus horses that were fed concentrate. But really, we're not dialing down into the grazing horse with that research. And so there are a few studies, very limited studies, that have looked at just hay versus pasture. A uh, fairly recent study by uh, Zhu and colleagues found some very broad, or, or characterized some very broad uh, parameters about the microbiome in horses fed hay versus uh, conserved silage and also pasture. And they reported greater alpha diversity and species differences, uh, differences in species composition in horses fed pasture uh, versus horses that were, were fed those other forage types. And in terms of species composition, they really look at differences in what is called beta diversity. So you see those colorful PCOA plots. And that's really what they're talking about is separation on those PCOA plots so you can see differences in species composition. Uh, but that's a pretty broad measure. Similarly, another recent study looked at fluctuations that occur during transitions from hay to, for or hay to pasture forage. And again, it was very broad okay, in terms of what they were able to report. Uh, so maybe some phylum level differences between firmicutes and bacteriodetes. Um, really subtle fluctuations though. But this question uh, had not been addressed. So you all are forage people. We're here for, for the International Grasslands Congress, right? Uh, and so this idea of what happens in the microbiome of forces when they're grazing warm season grasses versus, versus cool season grasses uh, had not been explored. The other thing that I mentioned in one of my earlier slides with this, was this idea of the relationship, right, between metabolism and the hindgut microbiome. And we know from our mouse model research from our human-based research, that they've actually been able to establish that dietary, uh, dietary treatments influence metabolism in the host in a microbiome-dependent manner. They have models where they can conclusively show causation. We don't necessarily have that in the horse, uh, but there have been a few studies that have started to explore uh, that association between the hindgut microbiome and equine metabolism. And there also have been a few studies that have started to explore some correlations between the microbiota and the nutrient composition in those forages. But really, a comprehensive evaluation of the interplay between forage nutrients, the high gut microbiome, and equine metabolism is still mostly a black box. And so in my dissertation research at Rutgers, we wanted to get at both of those things. So we were looking at integrating warm season grasses into cool season rotational grazing systems. We all know here in Kentucky, my dissertation research was at Rutgers uh, in New Brunswick, New Jersey. So temperate climate, still relying mostly on cool season grasses, Kentucky bluegrass, orchard grass, tall fescue as our primary forages. And we all know that our cool season grasses have this peak in production in the late spring to early summer. Another secondary peak is lower temperatures return in the fall, but then we have this summer slump forage gap. And so the idea being that we bridge that summer slump forage gap with warm season grasses that have a complementary growth pattern. The other thing that makes warm season grasses attractive to equine producers 
managers is the fact that warm season grasses are characteristically lower in non-structural carbohydrates. And when we think about some of those concerns uh, with consumption of, of NSC and how that might impact horses that are sensitive to metabolic perturbation, that has some interest uh, for equine owners and producers. And so to do this, we grazed horses across grazing systems that had cool season grasses, warm season grasses in them. We started with a standardized hay diet, cool season grasses in the spring, warm season grasses. Um, we looked at some warm season annuals, primarily a forage variety of crabgrass and a cold tolerant variety of Bermuda grass as a perennial grass. And then again, and return to cool season grasses in the fall and a standardized hay diet at the end of the grazing season. And we did fecal collection following two to three weeks of adaptation to each of these forage types. We also performed oral sugar tests on those animals so to assess their glucose and insulin responses uh, following adaptation to the cool season grass, the warm season grass, and the hay diet. And we looked at the microbiome. We wanted to look at it in two ways. First, we wanted to look at transition. So what happens as they transition from warm season grasses to cool season grasses, and then vice versa? And then the other part of this is, OK, what happens after they've then been adapted to those different forage types? And so we're going to start with talking about what happened when they were transitioning between warm season grasses to cool season grasses. For those of you who look at this and think I have no idea what she just put up here, we're going to orient you uh, a little bit just to make sure that everybody can follow along and understand what we're seeing in this plot. So each of these points is a sample. And our colors are mapped to individual animals. Our transitions of so cool season to warm season, warm season to cool season are matched to the shape. And our day in the transition between 0 and 6 is mapped to the size of the point, right? So if we have a sample that was taken on day six in the warm to cool uh, transition, that's going to be a really big triangle. And if we had an effective day, what we would expect to see in this plot is all of the triangles clustered up here, maybe all the big triangles, and all the little triangles clustered down here, and all of the small circles here, and all the big circles over here. We can obviously see by looking at this plot that that's not what was actually happening in these horses. And we can confirm that. We don't have to just do an eye test, all right? So we can do some statistical testing and we can say that really our effect of day and day and transition within a transition was very minimal, okay? We have a very low R square value there. So probably not a whole lot of fluctuation in species composition. And we can confirm that in some other ways. Uh, so we ran some random forest classifications, the idea being that if we can accurately predict the day within transition based on the microbial community composition, that means that the microbial community composition must be fluctuating quite a bit between days, right? And so our high value here is going to be, our highest is 1.0. So we can see from this that regardless of day, we have 0.25, not very high, especially when we compare it to other factors that we could do our random forest classification on, like the grazing system that the horses were managed in, or which transition, cool season to warm, warm season to cool, or even the individual horse itself. And our differential abundance testing confirmed this. Uh, so we were able to only identify three bacterial co-abundance groups that differed across days. Now, when I say a bacterial co-abundance group, that might not be something that you're really familiar with hearing. Usually speaking, when you see microbiome data, the most common way to analyze that is to group it by taxonomy, right? Well, of a genus level, or maybe a family level, or maybe even a phylum level that people will talk about or will write about. But those aren't necessarily physiologically or functionally homologous groups. Um, and so we took a different approach, and we grouped our bacteria by co-abundance or co-occurrence profiles. And we identified three groups that differed across days within transitions, but this was less than 1% of the total microbial community. All of this is evidence that tells us that as we transition these horses between warm season grasses and cool season grasses and back to warm season grasses and cool season grasses, really that microbial community is stable, at least across that initial six days of that transition. And we aren't seeing a whole lot in terms of perturbation 
occurring. However, we did see more, uh, more changes occurring as horses were adapting to those forages. Uh, so here we're looking at after horses have been adapted, again, hay, cool season grass in the spring, warm season grass in the summer slump, cool season grass back in the fall, and that final hay diet. And we did see that the alpha diversity, this is Shannon diversity, so this is a measure of species richness and evenness, um, that, that was greater when horses were adapted to warm season grasses in comparison to when they were uh, grazing cool season grasses. And then we went after a bit more evidence, right? So we identified again those co-occurrence groups that I talked about. Um, and we did a bunch of more computational analysis to get down to the heart of it, which bacteria were actually really truly being influenced by the microbial community. Um, and we identified 25 groups of bacteria that compromise about 10% of the total microbial community. And when we ran our random forest classification, we were able to predict what forage those horses were consuming with a 90% accuracy. Um, which means that vice versa, this is evidence that the microbial community is being impacted by the forage that the horses were consuming. Uh, we also were then able to do some differential abundance testing. I don't have time to show you <laughs> every result, but you certainly can check out the publication if you want. Um, but one of the main results that we found was that there were taxa that were enriched in horses that were consuming warm season grass, particularly Acromancia and Clostridium butyricum. And these are of interest because they have been identified as having roles in gut health. Uh, they've been investigated for pro potential probiotic use in humans as well as other uh, animal species, including livestock animal species. But not so much has been um, evaluated about these bacteria in the horse and what their role is in the equine gut. We then did a next step. So remember, I said we wanted to talk about relationships between the nutrients, the microbiota, and then what happens in the horse. And so this is that next step. And here we wanted to say, OK, I told you that I could predict what forage those horses were consuming based on their microbial community. Now, I'm telling you that I can predict with reasonable accuracy what the nutrient composition was, at least for crude protein, non-structural and water-soluble carbohydrates based on the microbial community composition. So this is basically just going back the other way instead of doing a random forest classification, we're doing a random forest regression, and we're able to pull these out. And this is really interesting because we would have thought it would have been the fiber, right? And even if you think about the magnitude of the difference, um, I didn't show you our, our, our nutrient composition here, but the magnitude of that difference in fiber was quite a bit greater than even for those other nutrients, and yet we still were able to pull out uh, crude protein, non-structural and water-soluble carbohydrates uh, rather than the fiber, which was an interesting result. And then we wrapped it all in here. So this is a big mess, right? And please don't try to read too much into this. This is all of those 25 groups that I said were most influenced by forage type, and every group has a little node. And this represents their correlation to our forage nutrients. And I wanted to remind you that when we're talking about the bacteria that were pulled out in terms of being enriched in our warm season grasses. Remember I told you there were groups that contained Acromancia and Clostridium butyricum. And here that's what we're showing. Okay, so we've got our group here that had the Clostridium butyricum in it, the group here that contained Acromancia, and we see that both of these groups were positively correlated with crude protein and negatively uh, correlated with our soluble carbohydrates. And then, remember I said we did oral sugar tests on these horses to look at their glucose and insulin responses uh, after they've been adapted to these forages. And we find that that group was negatively correlated with peak plasma glucose. So again here, we're starting to unravel uh, some of these relationships, some potential relationships that we could investigate uh, in the equine high gut microbiome in terms of their relation to uh, glucose and insulin metabolism in the horse. So just some final thoughts to wrap it up. Uh, what does it all mean? It means that they're stable across transitions between warm and cool season grasses. Um, we did find distinct but subtle shifts uh, that occurred in community composition as horses were adapted to different forages. We also found that the grazing horse microbiome was responsible, responsive to more than just fiber. 
uh, and identified some potential relationships between the grazing horse metabolism and the hind gut microbiota. And then I say the last, more research is needed. And we could throw up a million things up here. We could have a nice long discussion about everything that we don't know about the equine hind gut microbiome. We don't know how management systems and stocking methods influence it. We don't know much about for the relationships with forage chemical composition, botanical composition, factors like maturity. We also don't know much about how supplemental feeding strategies might integrate into this discussion, influences of geography and environment. We cannot assume that all everything is the same at different physiological stages, right? All of these studies that I've shown you have been in mature adult horses that are at maintenance. And so we've got to think about the fact that we've got probably different groups that are working in different classes of horses. And then obviously that role of microbiome in health outcomes. And I know you all probably hear every time you hear one of these talks that, oh, we need more research. And that just seems like it's self-evident. But I've got a little bit of facts <laughs> to back this up about why this is so important here. So if I just go to Google Scholar and I put gut microbiome into Google Scholar, I get just shy of 900,000 results that come back. Now, if I go in and I search equine hind gut microbiome, raise your hands if you think that that's more than a thousand hits. Raise your hands if you think it's less than a thousand hits. Okay? Look at that. This is fresh as of this morning, so this is the real deal. But if I, you had asked me this a month ago, all of you would have been right. Um, so we can see that we're pretty far behind. And even the people that are doing the research in the mouse models and that sort of thing would argue with you that they've got a long way to go. So giving some perspective. So we need a lot of research that combines all of these things, the composition, the function, the response to the diets in the microbiome, the res horse response to the diets, and finally that tying it up with all of those relationships and layering that on top of sound uh, sound experimental design and robust computational approaches. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who helped make this research possible, and if we've got time for a question. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but Dr. Nelson, uh, wha well, uh, sorry, Weiner Nelson's gonna be around so you guys can reach her out later. So now we have Dr. Carissa Wilkins. She is a associate professor at the University of Florida, and she is going to be presenting for us the improving best management practices on equine operations through the establishment of mixed warm season grass legume pastures, a model for facilitating peer-to-peer -peer learning. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Vasco, for that nice introduction, and sorry for the very long title. I shortened it <laughs> for you all here in the room. Um, but thank you. I, this is my first uh, time attending IGC, so I really appreciate the invitation to be a part of this thematic session this year. Um, and it's been great to just catch up with and see a lot of familiar faces, not only in the room today, but around the conference. Um, so this is a much more extension methods focused presentation. Um, I will not be sharing a lot of data for the talk this afternoon. Um, this was more of sort of a, an experiment in you know, if we're gonna look at feasibility of incorporating warm season legumes into existing grass, warm season grass pastures in parts of Florida, will we actually have the ability to do that with some of our equine facilities and equine operations? Um, we definitely have a lot of interest from horse people in wanting to improve some of the quantity and quality of their pastures. But again, the reason they have horses is often for competition or recreation. These are not livestock production types of species, and so the goals are very different, and we'll touch on that a little bit in terms of some of the pitfalls and some of the challenges that we experience with this project. So just to give a little bit of background, um, and this is not unique to Florida, um, I actually used to be at the University of Delaware, so have had positions in the Mid-Atlantic and also originally from the Midwest. Um, what do you guys typically notice when you drive through your county and you look at horse pastures? 
they are not, uh, they're not always super productive, right? There's a lot of loafing areas, a lot of really rough patches, um, not a lot of vegetative cover, and very short grass. Um, horses are very selective grazers, and they can basically start to rip it out at the root um, or the rhizome. So we see a lot of this in our horse pastures. Horses and, and horse people are known to, to kind of um, probably have more than one or two horses. They're like potato chips, you can't just have one. So accumulating, um, especially if we're talking about boarding and lessons facilities, we often have, you know, even if we have 30 or 40 acres, then we've got almost double the horses on that property in terms of horse to acre ratio. Um, so those are certainly some of the challenges. Specific to Florida then though, we have almost 400,000 horses in the state of Florida. And a lot of those horses are now, um, it's much more common to see these horses and these small acreage, in particularly small acreage equine properties in close proximity with urban and semi-urban areas. So pasture land is becoming a little bit harder to come by, lots of horses on small acreage and in very close proximity to businesses, other neighbors, those kinds of things. So there's an aesthetic issue if pastures don't look nice, but we also have, again, the productivity um, Dr. Vasco actually has a uh, published article in Journal of Equine Veterinary Science. We looked at forage utilization and pasture management practices in horse owners in Florida. And over 50% of the folks surveyed said that they have to feed hay year round, particularly in the winter um, when our warm season grasses go dormant, but also just year round. So that means again, they do not have good, healthy, productive pastures. They're having to supplemental feed their horses with, with harvested forage pretty frequently throughout the year. And then the other, f the, the other really important part of this is the need for improved water quality through adoption of pasture management BMPs. Reduction of reliance on commercial fertilizer, um, you know, good vegetative cover to control erosion and runoff and leaching in our pasture systems. There's a lot of state agency support for some of this work. Um, and actually what I'm presenting today is the educational part of a much larger project that comprised Dr. Vasco's dissertation work that she'll be presenting some of that uh, data later this afternoon. And then there's certainly potential, like I said, to improve pasture forage qu quality and quantity. And some of our more progressive horse owners are starting to see some value and have some interest in that. All right, so um, I'm gonna go very short on this because you will hear more about rhizomal peanut from Dr. Vasco today. Um, but rhizomal peanut, or RP, is a warm season perennial legume that is well adapted to our semi-tropical and, and subtropical regions here of the US, particularly in the Southeast and Florida. It has excellent nutritive value, so um, a lot of us tend to call rhizomal peanut the alfalfa of the south in terms of crude protein and digestible energy. It's most, you know, more comparable to other legume forages like alfalfa. And certainly it has the potential for fixing nitrogen and there is some data to support that. Um, particularly Dr. Jose Dubé and his lab group have looked at biological nitrogen fixation and when you incorporate perennial peanut into existing grass pastures, it can really support a lot of that nutrient cycling and nitrogen generation. Um, also, some of um, the previous work has shown that in pasture systems, when we incorporate rhizomal peanut into warm season grasses, it spreads and actually persists in grazed warm season mixed pastures for decades. So it's pretty robust um, once you get it established, and that's the hard part that we'll discuss here in a minute, um, but once you get it established, it sticks around for quite a while. So just some other things, um, when we combine um, the, the benefits in terms of reduced need for nitrogen fertilizer and overall just a reduction in off-farm nitrogen inputs, the use of legumes in our tropical grasslands can also help with that ground cover. And then again, in mitigating things like erosion and leaching of nutrients or, or runoff of nutrients from fields. Um, so although several benefits have been shown for the use of these legumes, um, again, horse people have been kind of slow to adopt this. And so awareness and interest in education is a huge part of this. So our objective for this project was to establish two demonstration sites of perennial peanut strip planted into existing Bahia grass pastures. Um, I, as I mentioned, this was an extension education deliverable, which was part of a much larger um, Florida Department of Agriculture, Office of Ag Water Policy funded study um, to look at the potential for rhizomal peanut to be incorporated into horse management systems to help mitigate environmental impacts. And again, you'll be hearing some more about this from Dr. Vasco today. So just briefly, um, kind of an overview of our methods, our overall approach for this educational part of the project. We did identify two, um, two acre demonstration areas. So we actually plucked out and identified, scouted and selected two acre areas within a larger part of the farm to establish on a small scale the rhizomal peanut by strip planting it into their existing bahia grass. Um, 
what we had to do was a lot of site prep. Um, the site prep included certainly soil testing to look at what nutrient levels were in the soil in that pasture system um, at the start. We also um, then did a burn down herbicide, so mostly glyphosate, just to basically you know, kill the bahia grass, get rid of that bahia grass in about 10 foot strips. And we did that um, just before tillage. And so we went through, we tore up that ground, tilled that, we repeated that process two times at each site prior to planting the rhizomal peanut. The variety that we did work with was EcoTurf. Um, what we actually ran into with this project right off the bat, um, so this was, this funding, this project with FDAC started between 2019 and 2020. So COVID obviously really kind of der derailed us a bit on, on many facets, but even after that, um, then we ran into significant weather issues. So the perennial peanut producer who we were getting our rhizomes, our material from, his field up in North Florida was so saturated that they couldn't actually get in and dig out the material that we needed. And then that also meant that he was delayed in producing his perennial peanut hay. So everyone was getting backlogged and everyone was also still getting sick with COVID. So we had all kinds of uh, delays in terms of actually trying to get this put in um, by 2021. So we had to postpone our planting to spring of 2022. We did end up planting in April. Um, we got it in at both sites, April 1st of just this past spring. And what we did in the interim, because um, we had already gone through and did our, our you know, glyphosate application and our tillage at both sites, we didn't want those to sit fallow for environmental and BMP reasons, but also with weed competition. So we actually did also a, a cool season annual planting, um, a mix of red clover, legend oat, and um, rye, and we actually just kept cool season forages in those strips to kind of hold them over until we could actually get in there and plant our rhizomal peanut. That also provided some additional educational opportunities, which was nice. So a little bit more specifics then. Our first site, um, the Heart of Florida Youth Ranch, this was a s roughly 65 acre facility. Um, they actually house at-risk youth at the center. So um, like kids and students from kind of, you know, disadvantaged families can actually live on site at the ranch. And then they utilize a group of horses for equine assisted activities and therapies for the kids. So they had eight horses at the time. Um, six were specifically used to deliver those EAS services for the kids. Two were privately owned. Um, the facility is existing pasture. You guys can see um, it's very short grass, pretty overgrazed, a lot of loafing areas, some weed competition, and they really didn't have an opportunity to rotate horses through or rest those fields very well. Part of the front pasture was also utilized as one of their training and exercise areas for the horses and the kids. So they were pretty limited, you know, even having 65 acres, there wasn't a lot of great forage to, to utilize on that premises. Um, they wanted a plan for, you know, resting and trying to, to take stock off of those pastures and just maybe have a more usable space. And they're also all about education because they've got kids there and they want to do um, good work for the community. Site two, um, Alligar Farm, this is a much larger facility. Um, this is approximately 200 acres that houses up to 80 horses at a given time of various breeds. Most of their horses are quarter horses and Arabians used for breeding and trail riding. In addition, um, her and her father often take some rescue horses in. So up to 15 or 20 of those animals might be rescue um, horses that they're gonna try to rehab and rehome. So just to give you guys an idea, so looking at our state, we're talking about North Central Florida. Our site one, the Heart of Florida Youth Ranch, was located between Gainesville and Ocala, which is definitely horse country in Florida. Our other site was more towards the Atlantic coastline over here in northeast Florida in a town called Elkton, kind of between Palatka and St. Augustine here. So pretty close proximity of each other, but within some of our more populated horse counties. So a little bit more about site prep and planting. So this is where it, it got interesting. Um, we definitely had a lot of challenges. One of the things that we started with um, at the Heart of Florida Youth Ranch, that site one, was a field that was in pretty poor condition. When we got out there um, within their bahia grass, the existing pasture forage out there, we ran into things like prickly pear and a lot of really tall, very mature dog fennel, pawpaw plants, all kinds of undesirables. And so before we could even get in there and glyphosate and till, we had to spot spray and, and put some herbicide uh, triclopore mixture on those, those uh, prickly pear plants. Um, so that was, that was a lot of work um, and added significantly to our cost of establishment as well. Um, certainly we all were a little bit sticker shocked, particularly this last year and being delayed to 2022 for our planting, the prices of herbicide, the prices of fertilizer went up pretty significantly. Um, so I think honestly, this, I cringe at this a bit, but I think if we had been able to plant the year before, it may not have cost that much at this site. 
Um, so we, we actually worked with a contractor at this site because uh, the staff there was pretty limited in their knowledge and ability to handle equipment. They were also very shorthanded on actual farm implements and equipment. So we did have to also pay a little bit more money to have a contractor come in. The one thing I will say, working with a contractor locally, I think our tillage, our herbicide applic applications, fertilization, everything at this site was done very well. And so ultimately, even though we started with a rougher field, we ended up with a lot better, quicker establishment. Um, the, the perennial peanut plants in this field have now spread and are incorporating into the bahia grass pretty well. They still have a ton of weed competition that we're dealing with, um, but they actually uh, overall have been pretty successful. The Elkton, Florida site, this is more on the, the east, eastern part of Florida. Um, this cooperator was much more involved herself with the establishment. So we helped um, with the, the FDAX funding, we were able to purchase herbicide and some of the supplies she needed, but she had a tractor. She had a nice mower. Um, she actually had a little pull behind three nozzle sprayer that she could actually attach to her ATV or the tractor. So she was able to do a much more of the work herself and was willing to do that as a cooperator on the project. Um, the one thing I will say is her soil, you guys can tell, like even between the two sites, her soil looks much richer. It's definitely a different type of soil. But what was interesting at her site is um, both sites, the pH wasn't quite ideal for rhizomal peanut. At site one at the Heart of Florida Youth Ranch, she was already around five and a half pH. So we did put dolomitic dol lime out, brought her pH up to six. The, the, this site too, in Alton, Florida, her pH was, it was only around about four and a half to 4.9. We applied lime and we went back and soil tested again a few months later and it was, it actually dropped like 0.1. <laughs> so I don't know, um, talking to our agronomy specialist, um, we think there might be some kind of weird buffering capacity in her soil. There's something else going on there potentially. So um, her peanut, this is, this is a photo taken in September. Um, there's some perennial peanut there, but it's struggling a lot more at, at her site. We don't know if it's just a pH issue, it's a competition issue. She had a lot more grass come back into her strips. And I think that's partly because she self-tilled with more with a like a rototiller. And I don't think she got as good soil contact when we actually, you know, tilled those strips, tried to clean those strips out, and then put the peanut in. Um, so there's definitely some challenges, and they're very different challenges across the two sites, but great for education. Um, it, it's been really interesting. So we also did some educational plot walks. Um, we hosted um, three of these in total. We did uh, two in the early, or well, during the winter of 2021 when we had the, the cool season forages planted to hold those strips over, talked about early establishment and what we had to do the next spring. And then we also did one um, just last summer at our uh, citrus site and tried to have some more folks come out and kind of see where we were at with the establishment. These were fairly informal. Um, they included the tour of, a, of the pasture area and the establishment site. We did some Q&A and discussion. We had state specialists there, county agents, the site cooperator was involved. Um, and, and they were nice, but they were not very well attended. And again, I think this was that transition between going from totally virtual to getting back to face to face. So despite some of the marketing and advertising, you know, we had really good interest from the folks that were there, but we had very, very small groups. Um, so we have these two sites now, and the plan hopefully in the future is to do more of these, better advertise, better marketing, hopefully get more people to come out and visit with us. So some of the specific challenges, I think the cost of establishment is likely gonna be prohibited, um, prohibitive for a lot of these folks, especially without funding support like cost share programs from, from our state agencies or, or some future grants. Um, further support is needed for, I think, for a lot of our horse folks, particularly if they're smaller scale, um, you know, equine operations that don't have a lot of resources, whether that's equipment, time, labor, I think, you know, better access to those resources is going to be pretty key if we want to see these BMPs implemented more widely. And then, as I mentioned, some of the pitfalls with the plot walks, um, setting those up as more formal field days and making them, um, you know, more accessible to others in the community, I think will be important. So just to finish up some outcomes and future directions, um, this has given us an opportunity to work multi-county and have some of these demonstration sites in these more horse populated areas. So hopefully for future education, um, that will be a, a possibility to have more folks come out. We have, um, you know, site cooperators themselves have been very involved in planning and hosting those events. So even though the turnout wasn't what we expected, they are on board with us and want to see us keep coming out. And I think that's really important. It allows equine owners and facility managers to have more of this peer-to-peer -peer learning. You know, they can listen to us talk all day long, but they really want to get out there and see 
what's working, what's not working. And I think the more they hear it from other horse people that are at least trying some of these things, they're much more willing to, to hear us out and to maybe try it themselves. And then they've got neighbors and community members that they can reach out to for help and advice as well. Um, so we would like to revisit um, some of the goals that these cooperators have. Ideally, the ultimate goal was to, this year, be able to put horses out on these little two-acre plots um, for, for different reasons, maybe some reduced feed costs for some of these folks, um, just to see the behavior of the horses, how they're performing on those little two-acre intermixed pastures. Um, but again, establishment's been challenging, and I'm not sure we're ready to put horse pressure on some of those, those areas just yet. So with that, I don't know if we have time. Thank you, Dr. Wiggins. Yes, we can okay. take one question for our speaker. Any questions? Yeah. Question would be, once you get that testing out, you want to test the other way in. So you're allowing the little maybe barren pastures on the perimeter of the enclosure? Yes, so I think like small scale at these two sites, we didn't want to plant huge areas. Um, we wanted to kind of like proof of concept, right? Feasibility, keep it small. We didn't have a huge budget. I had about $6,000 total from the Department of Ag to just do this very small scale and have it be more of that educational deliverable. But ideally, again, in about another year, we would like to try to get a, you know, just a pair of horses out on that two acres and take some forage, you know, nutrient analysis, collect samples, look at botanical composition, vegetative cover. There's a lot more that I want to do with this project now that we have these two sites. Um, but yeah, I think part of the challenge too, though, is if we'd had bigger areas, in some ways, at least when we work with contractors, that probably wouldn't have been, that would have been an advantage because when you, like the Elkton site, for example, there's a lot of potato harvesting and cabbage and like row crops. So the horse folks end up competing for the contractor's time if you know if we want lime put out or if we want fertilizer put out. If they can't do it themselves, they don't have the equipment or can't do it, then it's like who can come out and do it. And so that's also a, a limitation that we're finding. If it was a bigger area, then I think maybe we'd have less competition with that. But if it's between getting all the potatoes harvested and coming to do s you know two acres at someone's horse farm, maybe that's that's not feasible. Thank you, Dr. Wiggins. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Weiner Nelson again, and she's going to be talk about, uh, talking about horse and pasture responses, just talking methods, rotational versus continuous. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and so we already did the introductions the first time around, for those of you who weren't in here. Uh, Jennifer Weiner Nelson, I'm currently a postdoc at the USDA ARS Forage Animal Production Research Unit in Lexington, Kentucky, co-located with the University of Kentucky want to thank uh, FAPRU for allowing me to be here today, uh, but I know we're in the equine session, I told you before, so we're going to take it back to my, to my PhD research at Rutgers, um, and actually uh, the bulk of this is going to uh, discuss some of the research that is part of my advisor, Dr. Kerry Williams, um, extension program at Rutgers related to pasture management practices, and so when we're talking about continuous versus rotational grazing, and we think about practical, um, practical Im implementation of rotational grazing pa practices in the equine community. So there's probably some non-equine people in here. There's probably some livestock people in here. And for you, <laughs> it's going to make a whole lot of sense. And you're going to think, why are we even still doing this uh, at this point in the equine community? And, and you're going to figure out why in a minute. Um, so if we go out there and we do some surveys, and, and there's, there's a scattering of surveys uh, that have been conducted on the implementation of rotational grazing and you know some of them say about half of people will report that they've used rotational grazing 21% uh, will say oh we always use rotational grazing then there's some other studies a little higher 65% but then when they ask some follow-up questions right uh, in those studies to see do they, are they actually implementing these practices properly? Do they understand um, all tenets of those best management practices? That's where it starts to fall away. And there are studies where people have gone out and done on-farm surveys or follow-up survey or follow-ups on farm to, to what's reported on a survey. And what they'll find is that what people are reporting as being rotational grazing isn't in fact actually rotational grazing. So probably the people who are actually using rotational grazing in the equine community, well below that. 
And so probably all of you know this, but because we just demonstrated that probably most people in the equine community don't, may not even know what rotational grazing actually is, just to catch everybody up, we've got a continuous pasture over here, rotational pasture over here, divided into subsections. The horses can rotate through those sections based on forage availability. We can close them when there is not available forage in that section. And if so happens that there's not available forage, sufficient available forage in any sections, we can close them all, right, and put them in a sacrifice lot or stress lot area uh, where they have access to their shelter, their water, and their feed, but are held off of that pasture so it can rest and regrow. Versus our continuous guys over here, they've just been hanging out anywhere they want to all day long, all season long. And... When we look at the grazing research, we talked about the practical implications. Now when we talk about research, it gets even worse, <laughs> right? Um, so when we talk about research on rotational grazing in ruminant animal species, this body of literature is huge and it's been developed over decades and decades and decades and decades, right? Um, but when we look at the body of literature in horses, it is much smaller, much, much smaller and much more limited. Um, and this is especially you know, problematic when we consider that there are some species differences between ruminants and horses. Um, differences in factors like forage preference and grazing behavior. Differences in nutrient requirements and gastrointestinal physiology. Differences in animal management goals and what are considered to be drivers of enterprise profitability between those two species or sets of species. And in equine grazing research, we are even more plagued by the fact that most of the research out there, particularly when we're talking about whole pasture research, particularly when we're talking about this idea of rotational versus continuous stocking, um, there's a lack of sufficient replication, so a lack of replicated pastures, lack of replication over years, that hinders our ability to make intelligent recommendations when we're talking about things like Dr. Wickens was saying with best management practices, if we don't have sufficient data uh, to support the recommendations that we are giving to our producers. And so, like I said, I did my PhD at Rutgers with Dr. Kerry Williams. We were located at what is called the Rutgers Environmental Best Management Practices Demonstration Horse Farm. It is a mouthful, but our goal was, the overall goal was to develop grazing strategies that are not only economically and environmentally uh, sound, but also promote optimal horse health. And I'm going to talk to you about a couple of research objectives that we evaluated um, during my time at Rutgers, and some of this was a little bit before, and I came in as part of the tail end of it, especially with this uh, effects of rotational grazing on pasture soil and horse condition, um, and then a little bit about integrating alternative forage options to maximize summer grazing. Again, topics that have been well studied in ruminants, not so well studied in equine. And just a little bit about our study site before we start. Six and a half hectare pay pastures, so not a really large study area, but enough that we could sufficiently replicate. Um, we have mixed cool season grasses, tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, orchard grass, um, and a fight free tall fescue. And we graze 12 standard bred mares across three grazing seasons. Continuous, all right, is exactly what you saw in those first slides. Horses had access to everywhere all, at all times throughout the whole study period, right? Uh, rotational grazing, horses were moved through their rotational sections based on forage availability with a minimum sward height uh, allowable at 7.6 centimeters. And when we look at some of the results from this, here we're looking at herbage mass uh, on the y-axis and then across all the months um, that we collected data across. And you can see that especially as we start to get out here into year one, the full first year, the full second year over here, um, we really start to see some separation in herbage mass. So our, our rotational pastures in the red line, our continuous pasture in the blue line, and really we have a lot more herbage mass. We also found an increase in vegetative cover and the percentage of planted grasses uh, in those rotational fields. And when we looked at soil health properties, one of the major findings was that uh, continuous grazing caused compression of soil macropores, uh, which led to a reduction in water infiltration in those soils. 
And this is just a picture, because the picture says a thousand words. I just showed you the data, but this is probably a little easier to digest. This is a continuous pasture. This is a rotational pasture. This is during that third summer uh, that we grazed these, these pastures. And we can see pretty easily from this picture what the condition um, was based on these management systems. Also, we looked at how does this affect the horse. Uh, so we looked at here, we're talking body condition score, uh, scale one to nine. One is really, really emaciated. Nine is really, really fat. And again, over time, and we see, especially as we get out here, not exactly what we expected. Those continuous horses, um, they were fatter. Uh, and when we did percent body fat, uh, that bore, bore out with that as well, and so with ultrasound measures. And so really, um, we saw that these horses that were continuously grazed were fatter than the rotationally grazed horses. Uh, why that is, not 100% sure. However, um, if you think about the fact that when rotationally grazed horses were, uh, there wasn't sufficient forage, they are confined to a stress lot and fed hay at maintenance, right? It starts to make a little bit more sense. And then uh, the other thing that we want to, to make sure that you know, we looked at our forage nutrients forage chemical composition, not a whole lot of differences, minimal differences in forage chemical composition between our two pasture types. There was also a companion study where they looked at circulating glucose and insulin uh, in those horses across three seasons, across multiple years, finding that uh, the circulating glucose and insulin uh, was in within normal ranges for both systems regardless of season. Uh, so there really wasn't a huge impact uh, on glucose and insulin circulation in these horses based on their management system. So then we wrapped up that study, and this is as I was coming in in my PhD, and we wrapped up that study, and as everything goes, Dr. Wickens was talking about waiting for funding and all of those kinds of things, and we were kind of in that, that kind of lull before we could get going with anything else. And so we had some time and we had some pastures that had been obviously continuously and rotationally grazed, um, and some limitations on what we could use funding for on them. And so we thought, well, what about recovery, right? Because the one thing that we get asked from our constituents when we go out to their farms, oh, we put our horses out on the pasture. Why are they thin, right? I mean, there, there was grass there, right? In April, there, there was grass. Well, if you have destroyed your pasture, right? If you have mismanaged in a way that you have depleted your, your productivity of that pasture over time, it's going to take a while to get certain parameters back, and some of them you may never, and that's kind of was the premise of this study. So we were looking at recovery after winter rest, and what we really found is all the way out through July, we really had a lower herbage mass in our continuous system in this light blue than the rotational system in the, in the dark blue. And if you count in, in all of our winter rest, it took nine months for our herbage mass to our, our, our yield to normalize. And our botanical composition never did. We also looked um, then at integrating some warm season grasses. Those of you who are in here, uh, I'm sorry that we're going to repeat just a quick bit of this. But again, cool season grasses, high production in the late spring, early summer. Again, in the late, uh, or again in fall, as cooler temperatures return, potentially bridging that summer slump forage gap by integrating some warm season grasses that have that complementary growth pattern. And again, we are interested in this in horses because potentially those warm season grasses could have lower non-structural carbohydrate content. And this is what this looks like in real life. Okay, so this was two sections in one of our integrated systems. This was crabgrass forage variety, um, improved forage variety on the left, and a cool season grass mix on the right. This picture was taken August 6th. It was over 90 degrees that day. I can tell you it was hot and dry. And it was pretty easy to see from this picture um, that we had a lot more production in our uh, warm season annual crabgrass than we did in our cool season grass mix, which is about what you would expect. Um, this is just another picture. Some people always ask if horses will eat it. Uh, they will. They loved it. It was fine. Um, and so this is just one of our horses out there grazing that, that quick and break, quick and big crabgrass. And then just some data because pictures are nice, but we like to have some data too. Um, so here we're looking at carrying capacity in horse days per hectare 
uh, in that early period, so we're talking mid, um, mid-May to mid-July, our summer slump period, mid-July to mid-September, and our late period, mid-September to mid-November. And uh, exactly what we expected to see here in our hash purple bar, we have this crabgrass integrated, um, and this is that quick and big crabgrass, and it's really taking off and providing us with a lot of pasture uh, pr productivity over that summer slump period. But when we get into this late period, we see that we're, even in our cool season grasses uh, that were in that integrated system, so those are our purple dotted bars, didn't really match the pasture production in this late, uh, late season grazing that we saw in our uh, cool season grass control that had no warm season grasses integrated into it. And so this is kind of an issue with this that would have to be, to be addressed. There are several strategies, um, fortunately, uh, we haven't really gotten there yet, and I've, I've moved on, but that is kind of where this, uh, where this story leaves off. So, in conclusion, we have some evidence here, all right, some research that's replicated that we can show our constituents, right, that says that we can increase pasture production, promote vegetative cover, and improve soil health using rotational grazing. Um, we need a little bit more uh, development of strategies to extend the grazing season, but obviously we have some options now to bridge that summer slump forage gap. And uh, from that, we want to make sure that we can use these results to generate informed management decisions when we're talking to our constituents and our, our clientele in an extension setting. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody who helped make that research possible. And I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Weiner Nelson. Uh, any questions for our speaker? Whenever you're comparing those uh, rotational and, and continuous stalking, so you mentioned that the rotational stalking, you had a sacrifice area or a feeding. Did you have that for the continuous stalking also? No, they okay. had access to everywhere. Okay, so there. that means your mm -hmm. stalking rate or a measure of grazing intensity is gonna be very different. So your herbage okay. allowance for the continuous stalking is probably going to be much lower than the herbage allowance for the rotational stalking. So you're talking, are you talking about just animals per hectare or are you talking about no a animals per hectare is the same right right yes okay yes. but then one one you have the pasture yes plus the feed whereas the other one you only had the pasture so the herbage allowance the amount of forage per unit of or per kilogram of animal is quite different um in terms of Y yes, because they depleted yes. in in the in the but continuous. Yes, but they depleted because it was it was not sufficient. Yes. Whereas the other one, whenever it went down, we take the animals out. So I think this is a one of the biggest misunderstanding in terms of continuous and, and rotational stocking, mm -hmm. and we perpetuate that in extension. Is continuous is, con is uh, rotational is not better because it's rotational. And continuous not bad because continuous. It's the how bad, have you the bad it. part is how you have it stocked because yes. uh, poorly, uh, poor, uh, if you didn't have the, for the extra forage on the rotation stocking, you probably would see pretty much the same results as the continuous stocking. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's that's 100% yeah. true. So the I'll problem is that in New Jersey, and remember yeah. this is New Jersey, so it's a little bit different than some places. They're the m second most people dense state in the country, mm -hmm. and they are the most horse dense state country. And you've got a lot of little smart, small farmettes that yeah. don't have area, and they buy a whole lot of horse yeah. to put on a small area. And so this is more how can we help them manage what mm -hmm. they have because they don't have the option of changing their stocking rate. Yeah, but I think I it's the same thing you do for the continuous, for the rotation of stocking, you get a sacrifice area. Yeah. And you did the same thing is going to work the same way and uh, might be easier for some people to apply. Right. What, what we want to prevent, and, I, and I'm, I'm a little strong on that because there is a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, want to prevent is, the, is that misunderstanding that, oh, I'm s dividing my passion and I'm solving my problems. Mm -hmm. And it's actually not how we're going to solve that. We need to either decrease the demand or increase the offer. And in your case, you were able to increase the offer through the management, yeah. but it's not specifically the stocking method per se, but just how yeah. you manage it.
I'm just making sure I understand. You were you, you were feeding hay to either one if they ran out of grass, right? Yeah. Did you have to feed to the rotationally? St- yes, yeah, the rotationally stock because again, it's New Jersey, so we have winter, right, and everything right. dies, and so there is no nothing for them to eat during that time. Right. So um, there were there were less days. We also. They also did feed some to the continuous animals when that looked right. like it got, you know yeah. what I mean, down to the point that that was going to be a problem at the same rate, so 2.5%, you know what I mean, maintenance level feeding. But, um, yeah, there was hay fed to both groups. There was not a stark difference in that. And then that was all in the, in the, in the publication. I'm trying to remember, you know, I do not believe there was any, there were any differences between the system in that and then, from that, there wasn't a whole lot of difference in terms of um, in terms of feed cost. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. So next presenter is myself, Kara Vasco, and I'm going to be presenting uh, the study on herbage responses and performance of mature horses grazing warm season perennial grass legume mixed pastures. Well, so we've heard a lot about mixed pastures, but I'll give you a pretty quick introduction on my study. So we all know that warm season grass pastures are very productive, but for that, they require a lot of nitrogen fertilizer inputs. So a way for us to reduce the amount of nitrogen fertilizer applied in those pastures is utilizing legumes because of their uh, capacity, their ability to fix nitrogen. And one good option in Florida, where I did my PhD, so this study was done there, is to utilize rhizoma peanut. As Dr. Wiggins mentioned in her presentation, this is known as the um, alfalfa of the South. So um, there is a study also conducted at the University of Florida that showed that this system, so primarily bahia grass that is grown as one of the warm season grass pastures in Florida, when you combine this pasture with rhizoma peanut, it not only improves nutritive value of of the pasture, but also maintain uh, similar productivity, like animal production, as you can see here for average daily gain and gain per area. So our question was, we all, we all know that these can maintain productivity or even improve productivity and improve nutritive value in um, beef systems, but what about equine systems? So our question was, how would this type of pasture, so this mixed pasture, perform in equine operations? So with that, we hypothesized that incorporating rhizoma peanut into warm season grass pastures grazed by horses would one, offset inputs of nitrogen fertilizer and maintain forage production, two, increase forage nutritive value, and three, maintain animal body weight and condition. So with that, we aim to compare forage nutritive value and production and horse performance responses in continuously stocked uh, rhizoma peanut and bahia grass pastures compared with bahia grass monoculture with two levels of nitrogen fertilizer. So as I mentioned before, this study was conducted at the University of Florida at the uh, Beef Research Unit. Uh, The treatments included Argentine bahia grass monoculture fertilized with 120 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, in which we're going to call here BGN. The second treatment was bahia grass monoculture with no nitrogen at all, in which we're going to call here BG no nitrogen and bahia grass intercropped with um, florigrace rhizoma peanut with 30 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, in which we're going to call here RPBG. So we utilized one hectare pastures that were continuously stocked, as I just mentioned, from July to October for two years, so 2019 and 2020, and we used two mature horses per pasture, so one gelding and one mare per pasture. So for this study, we maintained herbage allowance, we adjusted herbage allowance, excuse me, uh, be weekly, and for that we move, we utilize the temporary fences. So we had two groups of measurements we did. One group of measurements we did every 14 days, and the other one we did every uh, 28 days. So the measurements we did every 14 days 
for Herbage mess in which you utilize the double sampling technique with the rising plate meter, as you can see here, as the indirect measurement and collecting the forage from that same area of the rising plate meter, utilizing the ring as the direct measurement. Stocking rate in which we divided the total body weight per animal unit per the total grazed area. Nutrient composition, and for that, we hand plucked the samples and sent to a commercial laboratory for the chemical analysis. Uh, botanical composition in which we did also a, uh, we also utilized a double sampling technique. So we did visual estimations as the indirect measurement utilizing ring for the area. And we collected that same area for hand separation and measuring the actual percentages of the components. And for that we divided those groups, those forage groups into bahia grass, rhizoma peanut and weeds being weeds, those for any forage that were not rhizoma peanut or uh, bahia grass. And we also measured animal performance as body weight, utilizing the platform scale and animal body condition. So uh, body condition of the horses utilizing the Hennequin score, which Dr. Uh, Weiner Nelson mentioned here, with a scale that goes from one to nine being one, very four, very emaciated, and nine, very fat, extremely fat. The measurements we did every 28 days were intake of dry matter, crude protein, and digestible energy, digestibility of dry matter and crude protein. And for these measurements of intake and digestibility, we utilize the dual marker system with titanium dioxide as the indirect, uh, as the external uh, marker, sorry, and uh, indigestible NDF as the internal marker. And we also measure the proportion of rhizoma peanut in the daily intake, so in the diet of those horses, utilizing the um, isotope, uh, the stable car carbon composition of uh, feces and forages during the measurements. So jumping into the results, um, I will start with herbage responses and then we jump into horse responses. So starting with herbage mass, as you can see here in my graph, you'll see the response in the y-axis and the evaluation dates in the x-axis. So we could see a um, treatment year evaluation day interaction on herbage mass and um, we saw that uh, fertilizing bahia grass provided increased herbage mass than the other, the other two treatments in a single observation in the first year, but no different was observed for the second year. But as a matter of curiosity, if you want to know the treatment responses, even though we had a tribal interaction, um, intercropping rhizoma peanut into bahia grass resulted in similar herbage mass compared to uh, fertilized bahia grass, whereas the non-fertilized bahia grass resulted in the least herbage mass of the, uh, compared to all of the other treatments. So that means, so this result means that intercropping rhizoma peanut into bahia grass pastures maintain productivity of those pastures, reducing the need for nitrogen fertilizer in this system. So moving on into stocking rate, so uh, there was also a treatment year um, evaluation day interaction for this response. As sim similarly to the previous graphs, you'll see the response here in the y-axis and the um, evaluation day in the x-axis. So we could see that Fertilizing bahia grass maintained increased stocking, so greater stocking rate compared to non-fertilized, compared to, let me just use this, so for the dashed line, which is the uh, fertilized bahia grass maintained a greater stocking rate compared to the non-fertilized, which is the solid line mid in the mid-season and the late season in the first year, and then in the mid-season in the second year. Whereas intercropping rhizoma peanut maintained greater stocking rate only later in the season in the first year. And that was it, no difference in the other time points. So moving on into botanical composition and I will present weeds percentage first and then I will discuss the percentage of uh, rhizoma peanut later in the presentation so we can discuss about the percentage of rhizoma peanut in the diet as well. So we could see that later in the season, not fertilizing uh, the Bermuda grass treatment, sorry, uh, resulted in increased weed percentage as compared to the other two treatments later in the presentation. It also resulted in an increase in weed percentage over time in the non-fertilized bahia grass, whereas the other two treatments, the bahia grass that was fertilized and the one that was intercropped with rhizoma peanut, maintained weed percentage across the time. So the similar weed percentages as you can see here in the very two bottom uh, lines in here, which is the, the fertilized bahia grass and the bahia grass intercropped with rhizoma peanut, 
associated with a similar herbage mass across most of the evaluations, observations that we saw in the previous slides, that indicates that intercropping rhizoma peanut not only helps reducing uh, the needs for fertilizers, for nitrogen fertilizers, sorry, but also seems a good strategy to maintain herbage mass and suppress weed in, the, in this case. So moving on into nutrient composition, and here we're talking about the nutrient composition of the forage. We're gonna talk about nutrient intake in a, in a, in a few minutes. So for the adjustability, there was also a treatment year evaluation day interaction for this response. And we only observe differences in mid-season in the first year where, where the bahia grass that was fertilized, re, re, fertilized sorry, what had greater digestible energy compared to the non-fertilized bahia grass and no treatment, uh, no differences across time in the second year. Moving on into crude protein, there was a, also a treatment year evaluation day interaction for this response with uh, the two treatments, the one that was fertilized and the one intercropped with rhizoma peanut had greater crude protein concentration than the non-fertilized earlier in the study in the first year. And then we observed in the second year that the two treatments, the one that was fertilized and the one intercropped with rhizoma peanut had also greater crude protein and then the non-fertilized but later in the season, in the second year, only the treatment that was intercropped with rhizoma peanut was able to sustain that high crude protein compared to the other two treatments. So jumping into intake and digestibility, just as a reminder, we measure those utilizing markers. So we could see that for crude protein digestibility, we had a treatment um, evaluation day interaction. So in the first two, measurements, so early and mid-season, we did not see any difference, but we could see that later in the season, um, the treatment that had rhizoma pina intercropted in it was able to maintain the crude protein digestibility higher, or greater, sorry, than the other two treatments, whereas the fertilized one decreased substantially, as you can see here. So just showing the results now as a in a table, so for intake and digestibility yet, we could see that the dry matter intake as a percentage of body weight, as well as the intake of digestible energy, so megacalories per day, were affected by treatment. No other variables that we measured were affected by treatment. So as you can see here, we had pretty high intake that we estimated, just a reminder, this was, these were estimated. So, um, as you can see, the non-fertilized treatment resulted in increase and in greater intake compared to the other, uh, to the uh, rhizoma peanut, to the bahia grass that was intercropped with rhizoma peanut. So these are substantially higher than the recommended for horses, which is from 2.5% to 2 of their body weight. However, there were some study studies that shown similar values, similar percentage, uh, percentages in the literature. However, these also utilize markers. So we do recognize that maybe there is some limitations, some metho methodological limitations associated to fitting the markers that are causing this substantially high intake in this case. So moving on into body weight and intake, uh, sorry, body weight and body condition score, there was no difference in animal performance. No, um, the, 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 the results were similar among all the three, tr the three treatments. So now that I mentioned that I was going to show percentage of rhizoma peanut separately because I wanted to show you the percentage of rhizoma peanut in the diet as well. So here is this graph. Let me just orient you before we move forward. So here we have the percent of rhizoma peanut in the diet, which is represented by this bar here. But you can also utilize this percentage here for the uh, percent of rhizoma peanut in the botanical composition. And in here for this line, you'll see the selection index in which we acquire this value by dividing the percent of rhizoma peanut in the diet by the percent of rhizoma peanut in the botanical composition. So there was no difference um, across time for selection index. So this selection index, index below one means that the horses preferred bahia grass over rhizoma peanut. 
as you can see here for the percentage of rhizoma peanut in the botanical composition, there was no difference over time, which averaged somewhat around 29% of the botanical composition. However, we did see a difference in the percent of rhizoma peanut in the diet of horses. So it was similar, so they were lower uh, at the beginning and the in the middle of the season, and then it increased. So it was somewhat around 15% here in the beginning and the middle of the experiment, and then later in the study, it increased to 25-ish uh, percent. So I just mentioned that selection index lower than one means that the horses end up, ended up selecting more bahia grass than rhizoma peanut. And the increase in rhizoma peanut in the diet may have been due to two different things, or maybe the, them both associated. First, at the beginning of the study, where we have this lower percent of the rhizoma peanut in the diet, may have caused, the, uh, the horses may have avoided this forage because maybe they did not have any prior experience and that's what horses do when they don't have access to a specific forage before. Or maybe later in the season, the, there was a change in canopy structure in these pastures. So as conclusions, the results do support the hypothesis that we had that incorporating rhizoma peanut into warm season pastures grazed by horse could offset nitrogen inputs um, as well as maintain um, herbage mass and animal performance. Uh, we could see that intercropping, rhizoma, uh, bahia uh, intercropping bahia grass with rhizoma peanut allowed pasture area to maintain these horses similar to bahia grass and greater than the non-fertilized bahia grass as well as maintained protein digestibility longer than the other treatment. And overall, incorporating rhizoma peanut into warm season grass pastures increases the sustainability of management practices in horse operations by decreasing off-farm nitrogen inputs. With that, I'll take any questions. Okay, now we'll open up the floor for questions. So any questions? How do you control the stubble height with horses related with, the, with this legume? We don't, because we did, we utilize the co continuous uh, method, as the continuous talking, so we did not control stubble height. Yes, which is, I if I if I'm honest, at like the beginning, if I could change, like if I could go could go back in time, I would try to think about rotational stocking because we could have done that. Other questions? N no, I don't think so. None of that. No. I mean, I don't think rhizoma peanut is grown anywhere other than Florida, maybe Georgia, and like South Alabama. I don't think. Do you? and we have a little bit more time if anyone else wants to ask any questions. Yes, so um, there is actually several people here in this room that did a lot of research of the same pasture utilizing cattle and they've shown really good results. I don't, do we, we also, yeah, we also have um, some studies with sheep. other questions? Thank you. So we got a couple minutes.
Okay, so our next speaker is Krista Lee from the University of Kentucky, and she is going to present an example of an outreach program for the horse pasture management and education. All right, well, thank you all um, for having me here this afternoon. Um, and as Dr. Vasco said, I'm going to be talking about our UK Horse Pasture Evaluation Program, telling you a little bit about it, um, and really looking more at the successes that we've had within that program. Um, so for the extent of this conversation, um, I'm fully aware this is an international audience. When I say UK, I mean University of Kentucky, not Great Britain. Okay, so everybody please know that first off. Um, second of all, if you haven't looked at a map in a while, this is where Kentucky is right here in the middle of the United States in the eastern half. Um, and if you're not aware, we are currently sitting right here in the very top. Lexington's about an hour and a half south of here. Um, so we're pretty close to where um, we do a lot of this sampling at. And if you're going on some of the mid-Congress tours on Wednesday, then you'll actually get to see some of the farms um, that have participated in our program. Um, so I want to start off by telling you kind of how we got to this program. Um, a lot of people think that we've had an equine science and management program at the University of Kentucky for a long time, and we really haven't, um, just like we haven't had a lot of equine-specific extension work um, at the University of Kentucky until fairly recently. And so I want to kind of walk through how all of that began. Um, and so there's one thing that you really need to understand about fescue, or about um, Kentucky, and that's that we do have a lot of tall fescue. And tall fescue toxicity is a major issue for us. Um, and because I do a lot of work with fescue, I want to really quickly go over some basics of that. So this is tall fescue. It's a cool season perennial bunch type grass. And it is often infected with an endophyte. So that's the squiggly little lines that you see there that live in between the cell walls. We know that the, um, that the plant is going to protect and provide um, food and shelter and a place to reproduce for the endophyte. And in return, the endophyte is going to provide that stress tolerance and pest deterrence. Um, the downside to uh, this nice little interaction is that it also produces a lot of compounds that are um, problematic to horses and other livestock. Um, so specifically ergot alkaloids, the one we look at most commonly is ergovaline. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of background of fescue toxicosis. So pre-2000, um, really, our, one of our big pasture issues has always been fescue toxicity. Um, so then back in 2001, 2002, we had an outbreak of MRLS, or mare reproductive loss syndrome, where we lost 40% of the full crop in, in uh, the state of Kentucky. Um, that's a big number. Um, it's a big industry for us, and we lost a ton of horses from it. Um, and a lot of people began turning to pasture and really questioning if that's what was going on. Um, was a was a fescue related issue. It turns out it wasn't. It turns out it was these caterpillars called the eastern tent caterpillars that the university was also key in in sorting out. Um, but in the meantime, it really gave the industry and the university an opportunity to realize that we really need each other. The industry said very clearly, we need the university to be dealing with these issues, and the university stepped up and said, yeah, we'd love to. So they created the equine initiative, um, and one of the programs that came out of that was the UK Horse Pasture Evaluation Program. Um, and so, plain and simple, this is a university-based fee-for-service horse sampling, um, horse pasture sampling program. So we go on to horse farms, we sample those pastures, and we educate those horse owners and farm managers as to what they have on their farms and how they can improve um, their pastures. Like I said, we are located in Lexington, Kentucky. We do service all farms within the state of Kentucky. Um, Dr. Smith won't let me go out of the state just yet for that, but I'm working on him. Um, and we do service all types of horse farms, regardless of breed, discipline, or size. Um, so a lot of people think of us just as the big commercial thoroughbred operations, like you see here in the picture. We do work with those farms. They're really important to us, but we also work with the really small mom and pop breeder farms. We work with the boarding facilities. We work with the backyard horses um, and truly everything in between. So I want to talk about a few goals that we have within our horse pasture evaluation uh, program. There's really four of them. One is to minimize the need for stored, for, uh, for stored feeds, such as hay and grain. Um, and that seems like a pretty insignificant thing to do on horse farms, but the truth is, is that um, the, the more either profitable we make horse farms or at least the less, um, less cost prohibitive it is to maintain horses, to maintain horse farms, then the longer that we're going to be able to hold on to that industry um, and not have it paved over with parking lots and mini malls and those kinds of things. Um, and so making it, um, making horse ownership a, a reasonable thing for small farms and also making it more profitable for those larger farms is really important to us. And the best way that I can help farms doing that is to reduce that need for hay and grain and to rely as much as possible on those pastures um, that we're so lucky to have here in Kentucky. 
Um, another thing, another big one for us is to reduce that tall fescue toxicosis on breeding farms. Obviously, a really important thing for those farms that are breeding, hopefully, um, the next Kentucky Derby winner and, and so on. Okay. Um, limiting, limit the negative impacts of horse grazing. So we're very fortunate that there isn't a lot of regulation regarding horse grazing um, in Kentucky or even in the U.S. right now. Um, but that is, that's probably going to change at some point. And the best way that we can protect ourselves um, and protect our industry is to make sure that we are very careful with the natural resources that we have and to protect those accordingly. So we spend a lot of time talking with horse owners about how to protect natural resources, why that's beneficial to them. Um, to their horses, to their farm, as well as to the industry as a whole. And then the last thing that we do is we work with um, undergraduate students a lot. So I hire undergrads to do a lot of the sampling for this program. Um, and we hope that when they leave us at the end of the summer, they at least have a better appreciation for agriculture, um, for the equine industry, for quality research, um, and those kinds of things. And every once in a while, we even convince one or two of them to stay for a master's program and, and really have a long, um, a long forage career with us. So I want to give you really quickly how we do some of our sampling. Um, nothing here is proprietary. I'll be glad to tell you all the nuts and bolts about it later if you're ever interested. Um, but I want to give us plenty of time to look more at some of the success stories that we have from it. Um, so we essentially collect three different types of samples within a pasture. The first one is going to be our species composition, and that's very basically what it sounds like. What, uh, what percentage of different species do we have? So fescue, bluegrass, orchard grass, um, some different weeds, things like that. We're also going to look at our ergovaline concentration. So remember, ergovaline is that ergot alkaloid that is produced by infected tall fescue. We're going to look at how much of that we have so that we can figure out if we have too much for those late-term pregnant mares. And then finally, we're going to look at our endophyte presence. And that's a very simple, is this individual blade of grass infected with an endophyte, yes or no? And then what percentage of them are infected, yes or no? So for species composition, here's a, a list of the species that we are identifying and looking for. So our desirables are typically going to be tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, orchard grass, and white clover. Obviously, tall fescue um, can be both an undesirable and a desirable, and we have to look at it a little bit more critically. Um, we also get a lot of nimble will. Um, nimble will is a native species to Kentucky that horses do not graze, um, and it is very well adapted to the area because it's native, so it takes over pastures pretty quickly, and we're going to see more of that here in a second. Um, and then we have categories for the other species that we'll see. So our broadleaf weeds, pretty self-explanatory. Warm season annual grasses, things like crabgrass and foxtail that we see a fair bit of. Weedy grasses and then bare soil. Um, and unfortunately, we do see a fair bit of bare soil in horse pastures as well. So for a long time, we did uh, this type of sampling using a visual method. So we had a, a two-foot square um, PVC grid that you see here, and we did a visual estimation. The problem is that we had a lot of person-to-person -person variation when we were doing this, and it took a long time to train students on how to do it. So in 2021, I believe, we switched over to using the occupancy method, um, which we find to be a little bit more scientific, a lot more objective, um, a little bit faster um, to teach the students, and we also have much better person-to-person um, -person consistently consistency so you can see here this is just a cattle panel um, we cut it down to size and spray paint it so it's easier to find um, and you identify the most dominant species within each square and record it um, and that's how we get our percentages um, admittedly we probably miss some of the smallest fractions um, in a pasture that we see with this method so bluegrass is one that sometimes we we don't capture as much of it um, because it'll be a very small amount in a lot of the squares. Um, so we do know there are some limitations to it. It's not perfect, um, but given, given the time and labor constraints, it seems to be the best method that we've been able to utilize so far. In addition to that, we do our fescue sampling, and as I mentioned earlier, we're going to take two, two fescue samples, an endophyte and an ergovaline sample. So our endophyte, again, is that yes or no infected, um, and we typically collect 20 tellers, um, analyze those um, using an immuno, immublot test kit. Um, and typically those numbers are going to come back 75% or greater. So it's not uncommon that we see those pastures highly infected. Um, I actually get more excited if I see a pasture that comes in that's really low, and that's pretty rare. So um, we pretty well assume that most of those pastures are going to be infected at this point. Then that ergovaline concentration that you see here, so we take 20 grab samples. It's going to simulate uh, horse grazing throughout the pasture. We're going to analyze that using HPLC with fluorescence detection. 
Um, and I could write a whole presentation and have just on how ergovaline varies by um, the time of year and management and grazing height and all those different things. So this is a number that changes quite re readily. Um, and so we use this really to give us information of how toxic is this pasture today, whereas our, our endophyte, pre uh, sorry, endophyte percentage tells us more about the long-term toxic uh, potential of a pasture. What's pretty unique about what some of the recommendations that we give people is this concept of ergovaline in total diet. So we know we can quantify how much ergovaline is found in the fescue, um, but we also know horses eat other things and we don't know how that affects um, their, their total outcome on that pasture. So we calculate ergovaline in total diet, which is simply looking at if the horse eats randomly throughout the field based on how much fescue is out there, how much other forages, um, how much ergovaline are they actually gonna be consuming. Um, and we set those uh, thresholds at 200 parts per billion for late-term pregnant mares and about 800 parts per billion for early-term pregnant mares. These are not hard and fast numbers, um, but based on our experience, based on literature, we feel pretty comfortable with these numbers. We take all of this information, including our species composition data, and we put it into a series of recommendations, and they typically have a, a red, green, or yellow um, category for each one of them. So for broadleaf weeds, you can see here, we said that a herbicide application is an option based on the amount of weeds that they had. Um, overseeding, complete reestablishment, warm season annual grass control, those are all not necessary because those numbers were pretty low. Um, so they're in a green category. And then our tall fescue mitigation, we said that is highly recommended because the ergovaline in total diet was pretty high and it would be concerning for late term pregnant mares. And so they get this type of recommendation for every pasture that we look at. Um, we try to do around 20 farms a year, uh, though recently it's been a lot more than that. Um, and we uh, cover about, we've covered about 26 different counties throughout the state, uh, about 250 individual evaluations. So it's quite easy to say that it's been a very successful program if you look at just the number of acres that we've done, the number of farms that we've done. Um, but I want to look now at, at some more specifics with that. Um, before I go from our sampling, if you have any more questions about how we do our sampling and that sort of thing, um, we wrote up a really nice chapter in this book here. It's online for about a hundred bucks. Um, and they've got a nice chapter in there about our pasture evaluation program. And again, I'm happy to share just about any details with anybody at any point. Um, so now we'll go on to some of those successes that I wanted to showcase with you guys. Um, so this was a farm in Woodford County, um, so right outside of Lexington that we visited. And this was way back in 2012. Um, this farm was owned by the dad, managed by the son. Um, and when I showed up there the first day, the son said, I don't need you here. I know what I'm doing and I don't need your help. But my dad says he wants you here, so here you are. Um, so that's a great way to start off your day, right? Um, they ain't saying that you're not needed here, but we're gonna do it anyway. So we did an evaluation on their entire farm and in this one field right next to their broodmare paddock, um, we found that it had 31% tall fescue, but it also had 41% bluegrass. So we're like, eh, it's kind of okay, um, but it does have a fair bit of ergovaline in it. We're pretty concerned about it. And he said, oh, we've had all kinds of foaling issues with that pasture as well. And so that made it a pretty clear decision that we need to do something about this pasture. So in, um, so in May, they chose, or based on that May uh, sampling, they decided to go ahead and spray a herbicide that will selectively kill tall fescue in that pasture. So it kills fescue, leaves everything else um, growing. And it was very effective. We had two rounds of spray, um, did very well. Pasture was looking great. The problem is that we also had a drought. Um, so the bluegrass, the orchard grass, the white clover all survived those plateau applications quite well. However, so did the nimble will. So you remember me mentioning earlier that nimble will, horses don't graze it, it takes over a pasture pretty readily. So we took out the one thing that can compete with nimble will, which is tall fescue, and um, we gave it a free reign within this pasture. Um, we also had a significant drought that hit us that same time, which uh, took out a lot of our bluegrass. So bluegrass does not survive hot, dry conditions very well. Um, so when you take out the, the fescue chemically, you take out the bluegrass with a drought, um, you really set the nimble will loose, and that's exactly what happened. So this pasture turned into a really nice stand of nimble will, um, and it looked pretty bad. We were pretty concerned about it. So in September, we made the decision to go ahead and spray it out completely with two rounds of glyphosate. Um, so we did that, we reseeded it. Um, we were a little late on the seeding, but we did get it in in time. So this was in October. I can tell you I've never prayed so much over a piece of ground in my life, um, but prayed over it quite consistently. And in December, this is what it looked like. And we were really, really happy with the success that we had in that pasture. 
Now, I could stop right here and say, yeah, everything went great. But the truth is, there is so much more to this story. So if we look at the data from this field over the next 10 years, um, we can really see how that field played out. So again, in 2012, when we started this whole process, we killed everything out. And then in 2013 um, is when we did our first evaluation post-seeding. You can't see my, my mouse up there. Um, so you can see here that we had a lot of orchard grass. Um, that would be what we expected. We seeded a 50-50 mix of orchard grass and bluegrass. Notice that the bluegrass is not that high. That's the blue line there. That's because bluegrass is really slow to get started and it takes a long time for it to really fill in a pasture enough for us to see it. Orchard grass, on the other hand, took off great. Who would love to have an 85% orchard grass pasture for their horses to graze? I know I would. Um, orchard grass does not stay in sand well, though, and over the next several years, you can see how it declined um, pretty, pretty consistently. However, at that same time, bluegrass filled in those areas, and so we see as the orchard grass is decreasing over a number of years, the bluegrass is increasing, um, which we ended up with a, a really nice about 50-50 mix. So we were really happy with this pasture until we got another drought in 2016, and that really reduced um, the amount of bluegrass that we had going forward our orchard grass continued um, to degrade. They also had a really great time at the sales in 2016 and they bought a lot of horses. So we had overgrazing, we had more drought conditions and we can see that everything started getting kind of funny in 2017, 2018. Um, so the farm manager came back to me, now we're best buddies and he says, hey, what's gonna survive heavy grazing and drought? Because obviously orchard grass and bluegrass isn't going to do that. And my answer was, well, that would be tall fescue. Right, so now we're gonna put the tall fescue back in the system. Um, but this time we put in a novel into fight tall fescue. So they seeded a novel in 2019. You can see it took off and did really well. He's up to almost 90% novel into fight tall fescue in that pasture. It has maintained really well since then. They've had no foaling issues with it. Um, they're pretty happy campers and they've since seeded a couple thousand pounds um, throughout the rest of their, their property. So I would certainly consider this one a win. Um, I wish I could say every pasture looked exactly like this they all don't um, but this is certainly one that really followed followed all the rules and it turned out really well however it was a 10 year or more process um, to really get here for this farm owner to finally decide yes I need to have a novel end of fight mix in with my bluegrass and my orchard grass so um, a few other successes within this program that I think are worth mentioning this is my favorite part is the students um, I love working with the students daily, um, and we really enjoy not only teaching them the basics of pasture management, but also hoping that they get a better understanding of agriculture as a whole. So they're a lot of fun. Um, it's very unfair to me that they are the same age every year, and I am a year older every year. Um, so I don't think that's fair. And then finally, um, we have used the connections that we've made with this, pro with this program um, to also get a few other grants to, re to fund some research that we've done. So we had an RCPP, that's a Regional Conservation Partnership Program through NRCS, um, leveraged about $300,000 to make um, improvements on horse farms. Um, you are like the coolest person ever if you show up at a horse farm and say, hey, I have $30,000, how do you wanna spend it? Right? Like they are pretty excited about that. Um, but we put in a lot of fencing for rotational grazing. We did some weed control, put in some automatic waters, those kinds of things, hosted some field days, trained some extension um, and NRCS personnel on how to interact with horse owners. And that program was so successful that they gave us more money. We applied for a conservation innovation grant um, to actually look at the economic and ecologic impacts of the original RCPP. So that project is still ongoing and we'll have that stuff published in the next year or two. Um, we also have developed a cool season pasture help scorecard, and this is useful for county extension agents and farm owners themselves to actually kind of walk through a pasture really quickly and score it um, based on 10 categories and get an idea of what, um, what areas need improvement in their pastures and what don't. So if you don't want to do a lot of detailed hand sampling, this is a great place to start. It's pretty user friendly. We have a publication up on our website now for that. Last slide, I promise. Uh, and then the last thing is that we have paired with the Alliance for Grassland Renewal and we hosted an equine and endophyte workshop. So this is a, a twist on their novel, in, novel endophyte tall fescue renovation workshops, specifically for horse farms. We sold it out in the first year. We're really, really happy with the turnout for that. If you're interested in learning more about novel endophyte fescues, we're gonna have um, a whole session of that on Thursday afternoon as well. And with that, um, I will leave you with my contact info if you have any questions.
we can take one more que one question for Crystal Lee. Any questions? Uh, with fescue and hay, have you seen any problems with pregnant mares? Thank you. Okay, for next presenter is again myself, Kara Vasco, <laughs> and I'm gonna present the urinal, vari the urinal variation in forage nutrient composition and metabolic parameters of horses grazing warm season perennial grass legume mixed pastures. Okay, so in horse operations, the concentration of non-structural carbohydrates, as mentioned by Dr. Weiner Nelson before, is a concern because it's usually associated with metabolic disorders, such as insulin resistance, laminitis, and so on and so forth. Some people tend to just have gr horses grazing these pastures at a specific time of the day because it's going to be lower. We're gonna talk about it in following slides. However, forage, concentrate, forage composition will vary diurnally. Usually, non-structural carbohydrates are greater in the, in, evening, in the afternoon and in the evening. So people tend to graze, to have horses grazing these pastures in the morning. So one alternative to have at least lower non-structural carbohydrates throughout the day, not only during the time of the, that people tend to have horses grazing, but also maybe in the afternoon so that horses can also graze in the afternoon, is utilizing warm season uh, grasses. They are lower in non-structural carbohydrates, so they are a great option for that. So going back to Florida, as I mentioned in the previous uh, presentation I did, so the base of Florida pastures is warm season grasses, primarily bahia grass, which is a warm season grass, very well grown over there. So it, 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 it not only is lower in non-structural carbohydrate, but it also low in nutritive value compared to other forages. So in that case, one way to overcome that low nutritive value is to intercrop legumes, as we mentioned before, due to the ability to improve, to fix uh, nitrogen, but also to improve nutritive value of those pastures. So with that way, we can increase nutritive value, but also again, decreasing nitrogen fertilizer requirements for that pasture. We talked about it, I showed you before, it does increase nutritive value, but how does horses perform grazing that pasture based on their metabolic responses? So that's what we wanted to answer with this study. So we hypothesized that warm season grass legume mixed pastures would show diurnal variation as all of the other pastures, and as well as other nutrients. However, due to the low known structural carbohydrate concentrations, they would elicite lower metabolic responses or even no metabolic responses in horses. So we aimed to investigate the diurnal variation and forage nutrient composition of this mixed pasture as well as the metabolic responses elicited by the horse uh, by grazing these pastures in the horses. So this study was conducted, it was a peer study, so it's a, a, uh, another study that we did um, together with the study that I just presented, it was done at the University of Florida Beef Unit um, Beef Research Unit. Treatments included um, Argentine bahia grass monoculture fertilized with 120 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, in which we're going to call here BGN. Bahia grass monoculture with no nitrogen at all, in which we're going to call here BG no nitrogen. And bahia grass intercropped with rhizoma peanut and 30 kilograms of uh, nitrogen per hectare in which we're gonna call here RPBG. We conducted this study for two years in 2019 and 2020 and we replicated twice each treatment. Uh, so we had two pressure, two pressure per treatment 
and two horses grazing this pasture. So it, one mare and one gelding. So for this study, we collected forage, fecal, and blood samples every 28 days and four times within a day. So every six hours within the collecting day. So at six, 12, 18, and zero hours. So every six hours. Forage samples, they were collected by hand, pl hand plucking them and then we sent to a commercial laboratory for analysis. We collected blood sample by a venipuncture of the jugular vein and we quantified that blood for glucose, insulin, and plasma urea nitrogen. And we collected feces by separating, so we did not collect directly from the re rectum, but we did make the horses to uh, defecate at the, at the time of the collection by separating them from their bodies. In that case, the horse would get a little stress and they would poop immediately. So even by pretending we were going to remove their bodies from the pasture, they would go ahead and say, no, okay, here's your sample. That's it. So we then analyzed that sample for pH and lactate. So moving on into the results and discussion. So there was no interaction of time of the day and treatment. So all of the data I'm going to present here is going to be discussed based on time of the day and then treatment. So starting with forage nutrient composition first. So we could see that some nutrient composition components here were affected by time of the day. So we could see, for instance, that digestible energy was higher at time 18 and lower in the more in the m in during the morning. So at 6 and 12. Crude protein decreased from 6 a.m. So at 6 uh, time 6. Um, so it decreased from time 6 to uh, 12, 18, and 0 hours, so it was lower in the afternoon and evening. F uh, the fiber components, they decreased from noon to the afternoon. And there was no difference for starch, but non-structural carbohydrates, we could see that there, there was indeed a decrease, an increase, sorry, from the morning collection, 6 a.m. until um, 6 p.m., so 16 hours. So as I mentioned before, people tend to have horses grazing in the morning because of this response, of course, of pastures having more non-structural carbohydrates in the, in the afternoon and in the evening. However, we could see that there is a reduced, uh, pro nu reduced nutritive value of these pastures. As you can see here, for instance, with, whoops, sorry. With reduced, where is my pointer here? With reduced digestible energy and increased fiber components. So there is indeed a redu reduction in pasture nutritive value in the morning and an increase in pasture nutritive value in the afternoon. So even though we could see, for instance, here that there is an increase in this non-structural carbohydrates concentration, even during the peak, it is still below the maximum recommended for metabolically challenged horses, which is from 10, 10 to 12 percent of non-structural carbohydrates. So that means that warm season grass legume mixed pastures may be a safe alternative for the whole, like for th grazing throughout the day for those uh, metabolically challenged horses. So moving on, still on nutrient composition, but moving on on treatment effect, then we could see that intercropping rhizoma peanut into bahia grass resulted in improved nutritive composition, nutri improved profile of this nutrient composition. As you can see here with increased digestible energy, increased protein, increased non-structural carbohydrates, still below the maximum recommended of 10 to 12, and decrease in fiber components, NDF and ADF. So moving on into fecal and blood metabolites. So as for time of the day, only lact fecal lactate and insulin were affected by time of the day. So as you can see here, fecal lactate increased from 6 a.m. to 6 in the morning to noon to 12, uh, to hour 12, uh, but still below the concerning values for horses. And as for insulin, this peaked at uh, hour 18, uh, which is 8.1, which again, it's still below the maximum, the concern for metabolic, for metabolic issues. So as you can see here at the bottom, I'm just going to talk this before. So ideally for healthy horses, we want insulin and this uh, insulin values to be below six, 62 micro international units per ml. So one thing that I want to point out here is that 
this peak in insulin at hour 16, sorry, at hour 18, followed the peak in non-structural carbohydrates in the pasture. So we can tell by this that indeed these pasture, these increase in the non-structural carbohydrate pastures did elicite um, uh, insulin, uh, insulinemic responses, excuse me, in horses. Um, but again, still below the, still within the range recommended uh, ideal for healthy horses. Um, moving on on the treatment effect on those metabolic responses, we could see that fecal pH, lactate, and insulin were affected by treatment. And you can see here for a fecal pH that the non-fertilized bahia grass pasture resulted in decreased uh, in lower uh, pH values in the feces compared to the fertilized bahia grass. Uh, following into lactate, we could see that intercropping rhizoma peanut into bahia grass as well as not fertilizing it at all resulted in increased lactate concentration in the feces. So uh, compared to the fertilized bahia grass. These values still are, again, within the um, values that we should not concern for horses because, again, it's a all forage diet, so it's usually okay, depending on how these pastures are being managed. For insulin, we could see that both fertilizing rhizoma peanut, fertilizing bahia grass, excuse me, and intercropping it with rhizoma peanut resulted in an increase in uh, insulinemic response compared to not fertilizing it at all. However, as I mentioned before, it is still below the uh, concerning values of um, 68 micro uh, international units per ml. So with these metabolic responses, we can kind of come to a conclusion that uh, warm season grass legume pressure seem to impose little to no uh, issues, no, no issues with metabolic responses um, for horses in general. So as conclusion, uh, the results do support our hypothesis that warm season grass legume mix pastures show, show a diurnal pattern in forage nutrient composition as all of the other pastures with increased non-structural carbohydrates later in the afternoon and in the evening. But uh, although some changes, which we believed it wouldn't cause any changes, although some changes in metabolic responses were elicited, they were insufficient to cause any concern on with metabolic issues. Um, if horses are limited to morning grazing, morning grazing, in this case, utilizing mixed pastures, so warm season mixed pastures, it is important to point out that the, nutri the nutritive, the nutritional, nutri the nutrient composition, excuse me, profile will be reduced, of course, but then we have to take that into consideration. And again, if it is this pasture, because the values are not concerning in the afternoon, I would recommend uh, full time turnout for these horses. Well, I did not have time to thank the uh, agency that funded this study and also the study, the other study that I presented before. So I'd like to thank the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Service for funding our study. And with that, I'll take any questions. Really good question. So the, all of the horses had 24 hours grazing throughout the whole grazing season, so from July to October throughout the whole year. So it was continuous grazing. They had no concentrate, no nor hay being fed. It was just the pasture. Yes, so we did for all of the studies we did throughout my PhD, we did measure pre yeah. values and then post, and we did check that they were all healthy horses.
that's a really good question um, and comment and overall. Um, I did I did think about on how that would be and I really wanted like in the future if I have any money of course that try to use metabolically challenged horses because I do think they would respond like they would have completely different responses. I agree with you. And one thing that like, a, r a really interesting thing to mention is that the horses in the non-fertilized Bahia grass, we could see, because we did uh, behavior observations, we could see those horses grabbing the whole plant. They were digging the rhizome. So they were eating a lot of non-structural carbohydrates. They, there was a lot of bare spot in that soil because there was not enough forage probably because they, or, or I don't know what was missing because they were looking for those rhizomes. And, you, we do, and I can actually share with you later, it's really cool if the horses are just like digging for rhizomes. So I do think that would be a completely different response in a similar question. So the question is, is it uh, all big or small? What side of the side area of the mountain is the most carbohydrate dense? Is that the middle? Is it mid cave? No, we didn't. We couldn't observe any difference like in the responses among treatments over time. We didn't see any difference. They did behave pretty similar, which I did not expect to find that response. That's a really good question. So I think a very low very, very, very low number would be willing to do that just because, again, it is more demanding during the establishment, so it takes a little longer for you to have those pastures being grazed. So I think we would have to work hard on the education program for that introduction, for that, for introducing rhizoma peanut into horse farms. And Dr. Regan's may just mention more about her experiences with it, but yes, I do think it's not. It's not in there yet. Uh, I heard you say that the only likelihood of uh, showing those horses that peanut deficiency is that they would have to have a high amount of peanut. Any other questions? Thank you so much.